I'd like to welcome this amazing panel here today. We have Charles Oppenheimer, the grandchild of Robert Oppenheimer, um, who is now based in San Francisco. He's an investor involved in the world of finance. He's also involved in the world of renewable energy and also a proponent for nuclear energy among um, his many talents. He has also uh, founded a project uh, five years ago called Project Oppenheimer, which is redefining and re-examining the legacy of his grandfather. Uh, he's one of the few pe family members who have decided that that is something worth diving back into, and he's busy trying to reframe it, and we really look forward to his insights and his historical perspectives. As you saw at the beginning of the, of the video, uh, the movie, I'm not sure how many of you have seen the movie, but the movie is a movie. There's a, a certain degree of fantasy in there as well, and I know uh, Charles might be putting the record straight on a few items there as well. Um, we also have Gary Jacobs, who is the president of the World Academy of Art and Science, which was co-founded by Robert Oppenheimer in 1960, along with luminaries such as Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein. And this is a historic moment, actually, this conversation, where we've brought these two generations together to complete the circle of history, to look at the profound uh, insights around uh, human security, the legacy of uh, Robert Oppenheimer, and what the work of the Academy is doing today. We also have Walt Stinson, who is the CEO of ListenApp. Uh, among Walt's many talents as an entrepreneur and tech businessman is the fact that he was instrumental in introducing CDs to America back in the 1980s. So he's been involved in cutting edge tech for a very long time. Charles, I'd like to start with you. Your grandfather's legacy is a, is a big one. And um, Speak to us a little bit more about your insights and why you decided to create uh, Project Oppenheimer and how that relates to what you're seeing in the world right now. Well, Brandon is not huge, but I called it the Oppenheimer Project, so a slight detail. Um, but yeah, being very closely related to a famous person, I don't know if anybody's experienced that, but it's kind of kind of strange, you know, people have their own impression and like in the case of the movie, make an entire product out of a family member where you don't have any say or control over any part of the process. That is part of being affiliated with history. You, you, know, you don't have a say, but I wanted to represent my grandfather's views directly to speak for them, to talk about what he really believed in, mainly because I think his values can really positively affect the world and that they're really relevant, what he believed in what he said about managing the effect of science and technology is still one of the most important things that we can deal with. And of course, he faced many dilemmas. Could you maybe speak about the dilemmas he faced and how he overcame them? Yeah, he faced some dilemmas. Anybody seen the movie? Uh, <laughs> um, but one that, that is not addressed in the, uh, the historical narrative. I mean, I think the central insight that he and um, Niels Bohr mainly had is that the advent of nuclear technology really changed things and put us in this new mode in humanity where the power of the technology we can create will enable us to like kill everybody or we have to survive in a new way through cooperation. And he saw that really in a fundamental way and, and, and very early. And the insights from that is, I feel like what we're dealing with today, things like dealing with climate change, is not a traditional war that you have against somebody else. You need to work with people in a way that he really urged in, in the 1940s. And one part that doesn't get as much talk as I'd like is his uh, advice around controlling fissionable material through international cooperation. And that's what he really worked on from the period of 45 through 47 and ultimately was kind of like attacked for his advice. And we did go into an arms race, but there was a way out of the arms race and it's still the same thing that we have today of more unity across mankind. Yeah. Just quickly before we move to Gary, what, what did the movie get right and what did the movie get wrong? Just two things quickly. Um, so it was, a, it was a good piece of art. You know, it was actually a really well done story that I think gives people insight into a story that many people didn't have. And it had a lot of the historical facts, right? Um, famously, uh, some, some things that I think that it could have done better is encourage more children into the discussion. I, I've met a lot of 
teens who couldn't go because it was rated R. Um, and I think, I think maybe that's the biggest question. It, it was kind of a movement right now with Oppenheimer that I don't view as just purely a family thing. People want to talk about science, the effect of technology, the threat of weapons. In my case, I want to talk about fission, its applicability to energy and saving us all is a, is a choice we make with technology. It's not just bombs. So I think that's the, the promise of the movie. What can we take away from it? How can we affect the world now around the hype, around a Hollywood movie and a renewed um, legacy of, of this man who happens to be my grandfather? Uh, talking about how we can influence the world now, um, I'd like to move to Gary Jacobs, who carries the torch of the uh, organization that Robin, Robert Oppenheimer co-founded back in 1960. And it was founded, you can elaborate more, Gary, but it was founded on the basis that scientists needed to have a moral conscience and they needed to look at the ethics of what they were creating. They couldn't just put things out in the world and hope for the best. And we've seen that with uh, many things. We now face that with AI, the same dilemma. Um, you've taken a group of scientists, I think there are 900 plus uh, academics and scientists in the World Academy. And Gary is busy trying to channel that into an ethical framework of how scientists and academics can now look to the future with, uh, with hindsight as to how they should plan you know, for a brighter future and for a, a more ethical future. Thank you, Grant. The, we didn't really realize for a long time the great significance of the events of 1945 to 1955 at, that led to the founding of the Academy, because it's 70, 60 years ago. It's a long time ago. We weren't, we weren't there at the time. But the more we researched it, the more we realized, we take for granted today that science is a reliable contributor to global society. In fact, all the opinion polls show that the scientists rank higher in trust than any other segment of population. About three times the level of national governments, about two and a half times that of international organizations, about three times higher than the level of multinational corporations, and some of them are even uh, lower. But we look to, we hold up science today. In 1945, up until 1945, science wasn't really such an important institution in the life of the world. Technology was, but technology not in the organized way that it, we have it today. It was the inventors of the, of the 19th century that launched the Industrial Revolution and even into the 20th century. But after the creation and use of the atomic bomb, suddenly, the world realized, and the scientists realized for the first time, we have a power greater than the power of any nation, greater than the power of any army, greater than the power of any economy. And we're responsible for that. And the idea that the scientists were living in an ivory tower, which is pretty true up until then, we're doing our fundamental research and what the world does is not really our concern. But after the use of the atomic bomb, a political decision, not the decision of scientists, not the decision of Robert Oppenheimer, and the scientists who had been involved in doing it because they were saving the world uh, from, uh, from what would be done by the enemy powers, suddenly realized we can't wash our hands. We are responsible for it, and we should have done more to see that this was not used. And of course, Oppenheimer and others at that time tried very hard to persuade the government not to use the weapon, and certainly not to use it the way it was used, because the war was pretty much over by then, and we don't need to do it. But the result was, over the next 10 years, Oppenheimer and other leading scientists started to speak out against the use, against the decision that the government had made. Oppenheimer was considered a treat. A tra a tra for a traitor, because he was speaking out against something that he had supported earlier. And that led to the founding of the World Academy, symbolically or representative that sci science cannot live in an ivory tower. We cannot say that's not our business. It is our business. We have to take responsibility. And the World Academy was founded in 1960 for that purpose, not to do fundamental research like so many re institutions all over the world, 
but to look at the social consequences of the work of scientists and the policy implications of it and what we could do to see that it was only used as a force for good and not the opposite. And that was the led to the birth of the uh, academy. And I mentioned that here, I think it's a relevant thing for business. I'm a business consultant with 40 years of work, looking and working with companies, some of them originally 100 years old by now or more, uh, and know how business has tended, as science did up until 1945, for a long time, business tended to say, well, our job is to produce things, sell them, and, and make money. Uh, it's not the social responsibility for what happens. And now suddenly, many co companies all over the world and their CEOs and boards who weren't educated about social responsibility are being held accountable. And the laws are changing and rules are changing uh, as it has, in, of course, in science also. Today, we can't buy a medicine that hasn't been cleared by the FDA uh, or decided that it's, a, it's safe for over-the-counter use. Uh, we can't, uh, we have to be responsible for the safety of our workers and the safety of our cars. Uh, and pretty much every technological innovation, uh, the, the purity of the foods that we sell uh, and so forth and so on, that wasn't the way it was. Even in pharmaceuticals, up until 1960, the Congress said that's not really our responsibility. And suddenly, they started deciding what could be sold and what couldn't. So I'm saying that I think it's really significant for business today, for business leaders today to understand that what's, what they're facing today as a challenge is due to the evolution of global society and due to the evolution of business where a lot of the important research now, and certainly the extension and application, is done by corporations. It's not determined in the laboratory of scientific research institutions anymore. And therefore, uh, the society is saying, and now it's not just a question of the invention, it's a question of our whole economic, our whole economic system is reaching a new level of impact similar to what the atomic bomb reached in 1945, that if we don't watch it, we can be undermining the, the sustainability of our planet. We can be, uh, we can be challenging the life and, uh, of people all over the world with the best of intentions of only producing more for everybody. So I think it's a good way for us to think about the challenges facing management, executives, and boards today to realize it's it's the result of the evolution of society. And Gary, just as science has done that, now business has to do it too. Yes. I wanted to pick up on that point, which is a very good one, and pass this question over to Walt, is that in no time in history have business leaders had so much power. In Oppenheimer's time in the 1940s, you would have had to have studied math and science and very technological issues for decades to get to where you, you need to be to influence world events. You have CEOs and business leaders today who can influence the world instantly through AI, technology, social media, and all kinds of other tools we have at our disposal. So I want to ask Walt um, how a CEO um, looks at being a responsible leader in today's fast-changing world and also accountability. Um, you know, recently we had an example where uh, Elon Musk switched off his Starlink satellite system when he heard about an attack on Ukraine. I'm not judging the, the events at all. I'm using that as an example of a CEO who has the power to change the, the, the course of a conflict across the world through his own decision and his own technology. And so, Walt, um, in the technological world, how would you suggest the leaders who are here today um, approach responsibility on a global level? What should they be looking out for? Well, technology today is decentralized. We were talking about the, the development of atomic weapons. That was a government-sponsored, centralized activity. And today, that's not the case. Um, what's interesting in the context of this event, Leaders on Purpose, is that the problems of the world we all recognize are growing exponentially. It's very difficult for us to even keep up with it. Um, 
there's one sector of the economy that's also growing exponentially, and that's the tech sector. Um, as humans, we have problems with exponential growth, whether it be the problems of growth or the opportunities that technology presents to us. Um, for example, I think everybody in this room knows what two times nine is, um, but very few people in the room probably know what two to the ninth is. Um, it's 512, a lot bigger than 18. And that's the way that our problems in the world are scaling up right now. And I think that's why everybody's so concerned. Um, what's interesting is that in my work in the, with the tech sector, I'm the managing director of HS4A, Human Security for All, which is a global campaign of the United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security and the World Academy of Art and Science. But my background, my career is in the tech sector. And what I see in the tech sector is the opportunity to address the world's most pressing problems. I see the innovation, I see the entrepreneurship, I see the uh, opportunity to uh, address, to close the gap on the SDGs that can't be closed simply with finance, but has to be closed also with technology, with technological innovation. So on Monday, um, I was at the UN uh, and we made an announcement that technology is now a pillar of human security right alongside food security, economic security, health security, environmental security, personal security, community security, and political security. And it's become the eighth pillar, why? Because we couldn't have eight billion people on this planet today if we didn't have technology. Technology enabled us to grow our population. But at the same time, we need technology to help us solve the problems that, that the eight billion people have created. And up until this point in time, business has been focused on, on production. But societal aspirations and government regulations are no longer allowing business to simply focus on production. Business needs to focus on sustainability as well. And by announcing the tech pillar of human security, the Consumer Technology Association stood up the entire industry, the entire technology industry, to recognize their role in helping to solve the world's most pressing problems. So it was truly a historic day on Monday at the UN. Thanks, Walt. And Back to Charles, uh, just to talk about the role of leadership in all of this. You spoke uh, about, when we had a chat a few weeks ago, about your grandfather's discomfort and inadequacy that he felt, and you took strength from that. I don't think anyone in this room has ever been at a position where they haven't had self-doubt, and you've taken a, a, a real step into you know, reinvigorating your grandfather's legacy. So talk to me about um, the sort of personal doubts you had, you took a bet with yourself, didn't you? Um, I will if it's the closing remarks, right? Uh, yeah. uh, great. Um, so yeah, I was, I was just making the point that it's it's not that fun always to compare yourself to Robert Oppenheimer. There's like no way to measure up. And all of us have that kind of challenge, right? We have these problems in the world and, and you say, can I contribute? Can I do anything here? These problems are so enormous. And I, I really do think we're all in that same boat. And I was able to it was relatively difficult. Our family tradition was to not uh, do public speaking or kind of represent yourself as a affiliated with the family. And I thought that probably the best way I could contribute was to go out in the world and participate in stuff like this and use the name and reputation where I could to help. But it, it doesn't mean that, uh, just like my grandfather kind of famously wrote that he disapproved of himself most of the time, it happens to me too when I'm making this effort. I'm not doing well enough, but you kind of got to give it your best shot. And if we if we could do any better, we would. So I encourage everybody to join in with that type of effort. Good, thank you, uh, Gary. You you have some framing of uh, this discussion around human security and the the human security campaign that we that we are trying to promote to the world. Can you give us a little bit more information about that? As we all know, the UN. Is 
with 193 countries adopted the Agenda 2030 with 17 uh, SDGs and 169 targets. And I think we pretty all also well know that we're falling far behind the realization of those targets. And in a, we were approached by the UN a, a year and a half ago uh, because we were talking and saying that it's not enough that governments uh, decide on implementing the, SDO, S, the SDGs. We need the participation of the whole society. This is the most monumental effort that humanity has ever taken to rapidly transform the way it functions. We have no precedent for this at the global level. Even at the national level, we don't see things like this. We cannot do it alone. Government cannot do it alone. That's what we told the UN. And then they took us up on it and they invited us in. Well, why don't you partner with us on trying to get that message out and build that sense of cooperation and participation by other segments of the society? which of course is already being done. We have NGOs that are working on climate change and on and other things. Well, we've gone out in the last one year to parliamentarians, 170 parliaments of the world, 140 national science academies of the world, uh, 600 of the top NGOs in the world, interfaith groups representing hundreds of millions uh, of people in the, in the country and in other countries as well, uh, to try to say that we're all responsible for this. But we need a message, not just that's understood by the scientists or the planners or the economists, that's understood by everybody. And the concept of human security was first formulated by the UN back in 1994, uh, but not really taken at the diplomatic level. And, but it's, a, it's, an, it's been adopted by the countries, it's there. So with the UN, we have launched what's called Human Security for All. And the importance of this is, the message is not about how many degrees centigrade we could, uh, we could handle before our forests burn and our, uh, our cities are flooded and everything. But what does this mean to people? What does it mean to each of us? What does security mean to each of us? We live at a time of unprecedented technological and economic development, but for some reason, a good reason I think, our level of insecurity is rising higher than before. All that we're doing is not giving us greater security because we realize the whole system is undermining our future and especially the future of our children. And Gary, we, we're very short on time. We have yeah. seconds left, but I'm sure we can squeeze another minute out of this. All of what you've said needs leaders, strong leaders, leaders who have real insights into how to solve these problems. And I wanted to ask Charles if about your grandfather's management style. Um, he, he, he had thousands of scientists and people who followed him. He influenced many, many people. What, if you had to describe his management style uh, as to what Gary's just spoken about in, in terms of solving problems today, what would that be? What would that look like? Sure. He always checked the time to make sure we have acceptable time. We're okay? One minute? Okay. Um, so, yeah, he was a great collaborative leader. Like, he, he was a guy especially in the beginning part of the Manhattan Project when they were trying to figure out the, the scientists that that method of in a discussion with a group of scientists, he could kind of lead without overwhelming the discussion and then had some attributes of leading thousands of these scientists in a way where he could get along with the military and the scientists and understand the fundamental parts of the scientists. And it, I think the, the funny thing to think about that is what a surprise it was. He was placed in that position and he wasn't a guy who was known to lead big labs. He was a quirky dude who liked Sanskrit and a lot of art, artistic things. But when put in the position of leadership, he was the right person for that moment in history. And that happens sometimes in history. And I guess we're all sitting around talking about him. But what I wonder is like what parts of that are replicable? Like when we need to do something really hard now in the world, like create abundant energy, could we could we recreate some parts of that, like a really big effort to come together with urgency to get over these problems and, and win, could I say, instead of talking about it, like they, 
you know, there's some element of getting a really hard job done, no matter what that 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 was represented there. Great, thank you. And I was told by the organizers of the, organizers of this event that only brave leaders who are willing to make big change in the world attend this event. So we would love to collaborate with you. We're all available to speak afterwards, and we would love to take this conversation forward. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much.